I'm going to invite you to pray with me, church. Our Father in heaven, we just sing glory and honor to your name. We bless your name with our mouths and with our hearts, asking that your kingdom would continue to show itself, that the kingdom would come and that your will would be done, that you would show us your plan for the whole world in, in obvious ways, in biblical ways, that we might submit our lives to doing your will as, as towards your ends. Lord, would you continue to give us everything we need for that? Daily bread, daily energy, daily wisdom. That, that we might continue to persevere with the responsibility that you've given to us. Lord, that as you meet our physical needs, you would also meet our spiritual needs that you would pour out grace in reminding us of the gospel according to the work of the Holy Spirit to bring us back into awe and wonder at your mercy and the forgiveness shown to us by your mercy on the cross and, and that we would be empowered to forgive others with that same kind of grace and lead us away from temptation. Lead us away from temptation, those things that steal our affections for you, that steal our joy, that steal our peace, that steal our hope, that steal love, and that you would deliver us from our enemies. That even as you've defeated sin, Satan, and death, we we live at times controlled by the power of sin and by the lies of Satan and by the fear of death. Would you deliver us from those? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It belongs all of it to you. We rest in that this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever it is that we're watching and listening to your word in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn to uh, Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to read verses 11 uh, down through uh, verse 27. As they heard these things, He proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him. We don't want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom, he had been, to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you. Because you are a severe man, you take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. May God be honored and blessed in the reading of his word. For those following Christ, it was all starting to come together They are about to enter into Jerusalem. Just a few miles away, they would join the throngs of of Jews who were coming to the city, the holy city, to celebrate the Passover. And for those who were following, the timing seemed exceptional. It couldn't have been better. You see, the people who would come to these festivals, especially at this time of year, when they would remember God's deliverance of them from the oppression of the Egyptians, they would be ready to be radicalized, to live out that story once again, believing believing that 
that God would deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. The holy city was always filled with a fiery zeal during this time of year. And, and there was even something more stirring. You see, there was something different happening. Those who were following Jesus knew their scriptures and the promise of a Messiah who would establish and reign over a kingdom. Combine that with what they heard Jesus say about himself and saw Jesus do according to his power. They heard Jesus call himself the Son of Man, referring to that awesome divine being in Daniel 7. They heard Jesus not turn down the title of Son of David as the one who had reestablished David's throne. And then they'd seen his authority. They'd seen his power in crazy, albeit compassionate ways. And now, 17 miles away from the holy city, they looked for, longed for, expected this outbreak of his redemptive powers to not only overthrow an oppressive government, but to overrun an old age and bring in a new age. It's hard not to fault them for thinking the day of the Lord was coming. In the book of Zechariah, uh, we read description about what the day would be like when the king would come to Jerusalem. In Zechariah 14, we read this. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. Then the Lord my God will come and all of the holy ones with him. That is all of the armies of heaven. On that day, there will be no light, no light nor cold or frost. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. The day of the Lord was this prophesied day of, of God's victory. It would be the day which the salvation of God would be revealed and affected for all of the people of God. But it would also be a day of judgment, a day of wrath against his enemies. So the day of salvation was also the day of judgment. This is what they're expecting when they go into Jerusalem. And they're seven days away from something that, that would be spectacular, but not maybe the day of the Lord that they had expected. See, Jesus here is trying to prepare them for what's to come. He's trying to, to show them that the kingdom might not come in a way that is obvious, and the day of the Lord might not be as, as prophesied as far as they understood it. So he tells them this parable to counter their expectations, and it's an allegory of his own life that speaks of his incarnation, his investment in his followers, his rejection by his enemies, and his crowning as the king. Finally, also an allusion to his return to judge the world. Seven days away from the crucifixion. What we read about in the New Testament is that it actually did usher in a new age that day. It would be the day when... Christ's enemies would be defeated, sin and Satan and death. And he would rise again victorious three days later as a demonstration of what the kingdom, a kingdom of renewal and a kingdom of resurrection and a kingdom of redemption would look like. Seven weeks later, Jesus would gather his disciples together in his resurrected form and he would give them these words out of Acts chapter 1. He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. What's he talking about? He's talking about his return. He's telling them, don't worry about when I return. Think about how I'm going to return. And goes on, says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. A few weeks later, the Holy Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter would preach and declare that the presence of the Holy Spirit on that day was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, the prophet Joel, that it was the day of the Lord. So in this moment, when Jesus gathers his disciples together, as he's about to leave, he gives them a mandate and then he gives them a promise. You are to be my witnesses all over, throughout the whole earth. And I will give you what you need. I will invest in you a power that will demonstrate that the kingdom is here and it's coming. Preparing everyone for the king's return. For everyone who has heard 
and believe the words of Jesus that they're sinners in need of a savior, but that he is the king of the universe, and that on the basis of that have repented of their sin, they've been given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works in all of us and through all of us to show us the kingdom in preparation for the king's return. The Holy Spirit and the gospel mandate is what this parable is all about. The Holy Spirit is what the minor represents. And the expectation would be that they would invest the power of the Holy Spirit in the proclamation of the gospel until he returned in glory. This is Christ's investment, not just in those disciples who stood there and saw him ascend up into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God, where he's preparing to return, but our expectation as well. So let's consider this. What does this passage tell us about how the king will come? You see, oftentimes we can get distracted thinking about when the king's going to come, that we lose sight. We lose sight of how Jesus is going to come. That's what he wants to get the disciples to believe. It's not about the time or the hour. It's about an expectation that we will be faithful with the investment that God has given us in the Holy Spirit in demonstrating and declaring the gospel until he returns. So let's consider this. What does the passage say about how the king will come? Well, first of all, a couple points. Number one, the kingdom was inevitable. It says that this nobleman would leave, but in his leaving, the servants would know a secret, that the place where they were was the kingdom, that the king may not be there and the kingdom would be obvious when he returned, but where they were right then in those moments, so was the kingdom. It was inevitable, not in that it was a future event, but that it was present and it was powerful, that it was being revealed. Graham Goldsworthy says this, through the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit makes the kingdom real for all who believe it. The kingdom is inevitable. When the gospel is preached and the gospel is believed, you see it. That's the first thing. Second thing, the king was coming back imminently, if not immediately. There was no reason to doubt his return. They had to live with this confidence in his return each and every day. Instead of trying to figure out how immediate it would be. See, it's the difference between planning to do work and doing work, right? I know for me, I think about that a lot. Do I have enough time in my week to do what the week demands? And sometimes I'm spending so much time planning that I'm not actually doing the work. When we're focused on the immediacy of Christ's kingdom, that is, figuring out when he's coming back, what we're not doing is doing the work of the gospel by the Holy Spirit. It's a subtle but important distinction. The king was coming imminently. It was coming and coming for sure. It just wasn't immediate and still isn't immediate. Number three, there would be an obvious and ongoing resistance while the king was away. The enemies of the noblemen, the enemies of the soon-to-be appointed king, would resist, reject, and revolt against the king. They would refuse his lordship, and they would refuse to acknowledge that the kingdom was there. And, and they would seek to bring chaos while he was gone, to live according to a different set of priorities, of seeking their own glory and rejecting his. Ultimately, those enemies would be on the wrong side of history and subsequently destroyed. Number four, and here's the main thrust of it, right? That the servants were to invest while he was away. That their responsibility was to do the business of the king and that way time wouldn't be lost. And his glory would be shared even as he was still coming back and yet to arrive. As they did the king's business, the kingdom would be seen by those who bought in to the kingdom. And number five, the faithful servants were given honor and responsibility when the king returned. That what they did in the time of waiting mattered, mattered for their place in the new kingdom. See, this is an allegory all about the reign of Christ. In his incarnation, he appears 
as a nobleman, that is humble. He's still the appointed, anointed king, but not yet appointed king. As we've seen and mentioned before, the first time Jesus came, he came in humility. The next time he's going to come in glory. We believe that he ascended into heaven, where right now he's still accomplishing his purposes according to his powerful word. Those who are Christians are the servants in this story. They have a responsibility. According to the Great Commission and the incredible blessing of the Holy Spirit, and that is to do the business of the kingdom. What is that? It's to make the invisible visible. It's to preach a gospel of victory, a gospel of hope, a gospel of expectation. That people can be delivered from the penalty of their sin. They they can be released from the power of sin. And that even as we struggle within this kingdom, as it is continuing to become manifest, but not yet manifest, we believe that the power is still at work. And that the Holy Spirit is continuing to show us the glory of Christ. When the king returns in the story, He meets with the servants to hear what they've done. And the first two had invested. They'd invested the valuable mina and the king gives them authority and responsibility in the new kingdom. See, it's always been God's plan that man would rule the earth. That man would rule the earth for God's glory and and for their good. That kingdom pattern was established in Eden with Adam and Eve being given the honor of of being greater than all of the other created beings and the responsibility to steward the earth and fill it, to be fruitful and multiply. We know that the kingdom broke but was present when Christ came the first time in his words and in his deeds and in his resurrection. And the kingdom present that has remained present is now proclaimed until the kingdom perfected comes upon his return. See, this remains God's plan. Men and women, humanity, are meant to rule over the whole earth, not be ruled by the things in the earth. He would destroy his enemies and he would place everything under the authority of men. That's kind of crazy, right? Like you would think that God should actually have, I don't know, maybe angels in control of this. That the angels would be the one to subject the whole earth to themselves? Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 2 kind of dispels this idea. He says, for he is not subjected to angels, the world to come that we're talking about. But someone somewhere has testified, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels for a short time. But you've crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subject to him. In Hebrews 2, we're told about the tension between what's happening in the spiritual realm and what's happening in the physical realm. And notice, notice that there will be a reign of men and women, humanity over everything. Yet right now, we do not yet see everything subject to him, which we would all say is true. But those in the kingdom will reign the kingdom with the king. The king's coming. He's coming imminently. And he's bringing his authority and will demonstrate that authority by subjecting everything to himself and to his servants. Until then, we serve the king in faithfulness. Now, it's encouraging me to some point that There's degrees of investment. You see, we have this all-in investing here. We have the one servant that produces 15 times what he was first given. You get the idea that he was all-in in doing the kingdom work. And then there was the second one, which invested but didn't bring about the same kind of return, but was still blessed with honor and responsibility in the new kingdom. And there's a varied commendation and varied responsibility The first servant gets those awesome words, well done. The second servant doesn't get those words. The first servant gets authority over ten cities. The second one gets authority over five. I don't want to get too in the weeds and all of that, but just to say that that what brings glory to the king is the investment 
of the followers to varying degrees of success. There's no description of what the degree of faithfulness is. It's just believing that that God's going to do that. For Zacchaeus, the story that we read last week, he was all in. He gave up everything. He paid back all that he had stolen four times. He was all in. He gave his life for the gospel, eventually becoming a pastor. That's what he was compelled to do. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. It was the outflow of his encounter with Christ. And so there's a certain degree of encouragement that says all all the king is asking us to do is to be faithful and to leave the results to him. We don't play comparisons. There's heroes of the faith who are going to have a greater reward. And don't stress it. And don't play the comparison game. Just be faithful. For some, it might mean a full overhaul of their life. For others, it's maybe the need to have the gospel inform the various aspects of their life, like work and family. For some, it's selling everything and moving to a corner of the earth that hasn't heard the gospel. For most, it's about allowing the gospel to affect every relationship and every task, and every part of their lives. Wherever you are is where God has placed you. And wherever you are that God has placed you, he's placed you there for a reason. And it's not because he's concerned about your comfort. He's concerned about the kingdom. He's concerned about lost people. So even though we see varying degrees of success, we do see two faithful servants investing. What you can't do is nothing. See, the opposite of faithfulness, it isn't rebellion, the opposite of faithfulness, according to this passage, is fear. You'd think that fear would be a motivator, but it appears that it's paralyzing. The third servant who fears the king and fears failure and fears judgment He doesn't do anything at all. And what does he receive? Judgment on the basis of his failure. A little bit of self-fulfilling prophecy in there. And I think it's important for us to note that sometimes sin is doing nothing at all. But fear got a hold of him. And fear overwhelmed his faithfulness. What was he afraid of? Well, I just kind of mentioned it, but let's get into it a little bit just quickly. He was... Afraid of failure, obviously. He was afraid that if he invested, he would lose it and he would receive more. He would receive more condemnation when the king would return. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. The investment that Christ has given us and and the moves in us and through us to bring about the gospel is that it will always produce. In Isaiah 55, we read this. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What's the promise? That when we proclaim the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will bring about God's desired result. It'll bring about fruitfulness. In another parable that Jesus tells, he talks about how uh, a man went out to sow different kinds of seeds and those seeds fell on four different kinds of soil. And on the basis of of the type of soil that it fell upon was the basis on which the, the plant would grow. And some soils would produce good fruit and, and others didn't. The purpose of that passage is to say, don't try to figure out what soil you're sowing on. Just go out and sow the seed. Throw it everywhere. And some will gather some fruit. See, it's not our responsibility to save people. And in fact, if we take that on ourselves, that we can't save people, we can't do this right, we're actually going to kill ourselves and others by trying to be their Messiah. Or we're going to give up because it's so hard. 
But here's the thing. God isn't asking you to be successful. He's asking you to be faithful. And we need to be reminded that doing nothing is sin. If you sit on the seed, you're being faithless. And when you're faithless, you're really a fool. And to do nothing with the gospel, to not seek the gospel's work in our lives, to not seek the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is foolish. Not only will you not see the power of God at work in, around you, or through you, you'll likely wrestle with doubts that the king is coming back or ever existed at all. I mean, that's, that's the problem here, right? This man just was so overwhelmed by fear and in his insecurity, he was useless. And he totally, totally degraded the value of what the nobleman had given him. Why did he do it? Out of fear of failure, maybe, or out of fear of judgment. There's this fear that if he loses the mine, he's going to receive condemnation. He's afraid of his master. He says that. He, He knew that his master was stern and serious, and he was not wrong. But here's the thing about our master, about our king. He is serious about gospel work, but he loves us as his servants. I want to take you to 1 John 4. By this is love perfected within us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever has fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. We know this. Christ is serious and he's passionate about his glory, but he's also loving. And here's what I've known in my own life. That when I'm cultivating a loving friendship with Christ and I'm growing in intimacy with him, I begin to see the spirit and the power of the gospel at work. In me. And then I begin to see it at work around me. And then I get to see it at work through me. And it becomes easier and easier to invest. It takes each and every day resting and remembering the love of God. That as we rest in his goodness, it will bring about a confidence that the work that he's doing in us, he'll also do around us. And that when he returns, we will be overwhelmed not with fear, but with love. Don't you want that? Oh, I desperately want that. That type of expectation when the king's going to return. It's the same thing Moses said. Let me see your glory. And God gives him the truth. And it changes his whole outlook. It changes his whole being. And when we're engaged In embracing God in his love for his glory, so are we. Are you aware of it? The power of the gospel and the power of the spirit is working in us. Do you know it? Are you being brought into the loving embrace of the king each and every day in both success and in failure? Is he your friend? Or is Christ just an acquaintance? Is the spirit a presence you're aware of or a power, a power that you've diminished? Don't wrap the investment in a handkerchief. What does that mean? When you say, I don't really go to church at all, only when it's convenient, handkerchief. I don't really connect with other believers, handkerchief. I don't really find ways to get into the community and be the light in the darkness. It's a handkerchief. I like to study scripture, do Bible studies. Those things are great. You may even like to argue about when Jesus is coming back. But if you don't know any lost people, you've invested, taken the investment and put it in a handkerchief. All of which, all of these things, is your life hidden away, doing nothing. It's not holy, it's unholy. It's not humble, it's proud. It's not giving, it's taking. It's not faithful, it's unfaithful. It's fleshly and it's wrong. But it's not too late. It's not. And we can repent of doing nothing 
and once again be brought into the loving embrace of the king, remembering his goodness towards us and the investment that he's made in us and share his glory. That's going to bring about the kingdom here on earth and you're going to see it. You're going to see the secret. I'll finish by taking you back to Hebrews chapter 2. Remember we just read it? Where there's this description that for all of humanity, everything will be placed subject under his feet. As yet, we do not see it. But in the next verse, it says this, but we do see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for a short time, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Do you see Jesus? Do you see him crowned with glory and honor? Do you see that on the day that he suffered his death, the day of the Lord came as confirmed by the coming of the Holy Spirit in saving us and removing judgment from us that we might preach the gospel, that others might be saved and have their judgment removed? Do you see Jesus? See him now. He's the king now, seated at the right hand of the Father. See him crowned. A crown that no one can take away. See him crowned with glory and honor. It's true and it's powerful. See it and believe it. Embrace it and live it to his glory and in his name. Let's pray. King Jesus, move in us. Move in our church as individuals collected together under your authority and under your power, believing in the gospel, repenting of our sins, and being given the Holy Spirit, would you move in us by your Holy Spirit for your priorities? In these politically divisive times, Lord, it's really easy for us to ask the question, is God on my side? Oh, Lord Jesus, might you cause us to ask a different question. Might it be, am I on God's side? Might we all examine our heart's motivations to see your glory come here on earth and to be a part of it. In the proclamation of this good gospel, the demonstration of your power to change our lives and that that would be, that would make it clear that the spiritual kingdom is here and the power of the spirit is at work. Bless us in this way, in your name and for your glory we pray, amen.